just a, a reminder that uh, this seminar is a kind of trailer for the resumption of the Wordsworth Winter School next February and the Wordsworth Summer Conference, we hope, in August of 2022. And you can find out more on the Wordsworth Conference Foundation website uh, or by Googling the events. And at 11.30 this morning, before our first panel, Peter Dale, uh, who with Brandon Yen is one of the new directors of the Winter School, is going to say uh, some words about what we can expect at the event um, uh, on the 19th of February next year. Uh, so that's uh, what's on for us uh, this morning. Um, and I'm going to uh, move now straight to uh, organize, to introducing our first speaker, who really needs no introduction, uh, to the Wordsworth Conference Foundation. Simon Bainbridge is Professor of English at Lancaster University. Uh, he's had a long and distinguished uh, career uh, at many English universities, including, of course, Lancaster, but also Keele. He's the author of uh, many essays, articles, uh, and major studies of British Romanticism. His first book was Napoleon and English Romanticism, published back in 1995, uh, and he stayed with uh, the Napoleonic era in his second book, British Poetry and the Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, which was published in 2003. His most recent book um, was published last year, uh, and it shows him taking a, a very different direction, at least in print, uh, but not, I know, in his own interests as a climber, uh, the book was called and is called Mountaineering and British Romanticism, the Literary Cultures of Climbing, 1770 to 1836, uh, published by OUP, as I say, last year. And uh, Simon is staying uh, on the topic of um, mountaineering for us this morning. He's going to speak to us now on the topic Ringing Changes on Foot, Romanticism and the rhythms of mountaineering. So welcome, Simon, and I'm handing over to you now. Thank you very much indeed, Nick, for that kind introduction, and also for organising this event. I'd also like to thank uh, Paige very much for the um, technical and organisational support. I know that she's uh, with us in the middle of the night, so uh, it's great to have that support. Thank you very much, uh, Paige. And um, uh, thanks very much to everyone for, for joining us this morning. Um, it's uh, a great pleasure to be able to talk to you all around all around the world. And um, uh, I, again, I appreciate many of you up at strange hours. So, um, uh, so I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. So I'm going to just share my screen and bring up a PowerPoint presentation now. So I think I just need to have the participant screen sharing um, facilitated now, please, Paige. Hang on just a second, Simon. Let me make sure that you're allowed. Um, I think you should be able to share your screen. You want to give it a try? I'm just being told host disabled participant <gasps> screen sharing. Oh, very rude. Okay, <laughs> let me make sure. Oh dear, okay, Simon, I'm gonna make you the host. And so when we're done, go ahead and make me the host again, okay? <laughs> okay. So I'm the host now. Uh, so I can share my screen. So thank you all for your patience while we sorted that out. So hopefully now um, you can see that title page there. Uh, as Nick said, my talk is uh, entitled Ringing Changes on Foot, Romanticism and the Rhythms of Mountaineering. So on Sunday, the 2nd of August, 1818, John Keats reached the summit of Ben Nevis making him the only major writer of the Romantic period to climb the highest mountain in the British Isles. For Keats, a writer of great mountaineering ambitions who hoped to ascend Mont Blanc, this was a key moment in the poetic training programme he had devised for himself, 
the Northern walking tour undertaken because, I quote, it would give me more experience, rub off more prejudice, use me to more hardship, identify finer scenes, load me with grander mountains and strengthen more my reach in poetry than would stopping at home among books, even though I should reach Homer. For Keats, straining to gain summits rather than stretching for a copy of the Odyssey was the means to strengthen his poetic powers. And scaling Ben Nevis did indeed provide Keats with hardship. On completing the climb, he wrote to his brother Tom that, I am heartily glad it is done and declared that I will never ascend another mountain in this empire. For him, the ascent was a necessary task, an empowering qualification for the poetic role he desired, rather than a pleasurable experience that he would seek to repeat. While the phrase in this empire leaves open the possibility of further Alpine adventures, Keats would never ascend another mountain in his life. While Keats devotes much of his letter to Tom to the unprecedented visual sensations revealed through Elevation, his epistolary account also highlights another fundamental aspect of the climbing experience that I want to argue inspires and shapes much of the romantic writing of mountaineering, its rhythms. These rhythms can take a number of forms, from the larger cadences of ascent and descent experienced in a lengthy expedition, through the repeated sequences of effort and recovery required to scale a large mountain, what Keats describes as the fag and tug and rest needed to climb the Ben, to the patterns produced by the specific movements required to progress across challenging terrain. Keats's letter is particularly effective in its evocation of this last type of rhythm, as the poet describes to his brother how certain patterns were produced and disrupted by his movement across what he describes as the thousands of acres of large loose stones that comprise the whole immense head of the mountain. Keats writes, I've said nothing yet of our getting on among the loose stones, large and small, sometimes on two, sometimes on three, sometimes on four legs, sometimes two and stick, sometimes three and stick, then four again, then two, then a jump, so that we kept on ringing changes on foot, hand, stick, jump, boggle, stumble, foot, hand, foot, very gingerly stick again, and then again, a game at all fours. In this brilliant passage, Keats emphasizes the kinesthetic and complexly rhythmic nature of his mountain experience. The poet becomes all arms and legs and a stick, perceiving the world through movement and touch as he steps, jumps and crawls from rock to rock. Through the challenge of climbing Ben Nevis, Keats becomes alert to his body and its interactions with the physical environment of loose stones, large and small. He moves through space and time, his boggling, stumbling limbs improvising an irregular rhythm as he hesitates and commits himself to the variegated terrain. Like the prose in which he describes it, Keats's spontaneous movements, a complex sequence of repetitions and variations created by the coming together of a particular body with a specific landscape, becomes a performance like the change ringing of campanology, the rhythms of physical movement equated with the pattern of peeling bells. Climbing and writing become music chiming erratically across mountain and page. Keats's Ben Nevis letter indicates how the evolving pursuit of mountaineering, an activity which many Romantic period authors engaged in and wrote about, could stimulate texts that echoed and incorporated the activity's own rhythms in their literary forms. Whether Keats's experience of ringing changes on foot shaped the metrical patterns of his poetic output is a wider question that's difficult to answer. It's not notable that the sonnet he penned on Ben Nevis's summit feels much more static than his epistolary account. Other Romantic period poets, however, certainly sought to incorporate the rhythms of mountaineering into the oral patterns of their own verse, even if the greater regularity of their stanzas often suggests a lack of Keats's first-hand experience. 
Felicia Heenans, for example, opens her Mountaineer song, published in Domestic Affections in 1812, by seeking to echo both the sounds of the mountain breeze and the airy step of the Alpine shepherd who sings the song. Blow, mountain breeze, all wild like thee, unfettered as thy wing I rove, with airy step and spirit free, from snowy cliff to shadowy grove, and teach lone echoes to prolong, from caves remote my sprightly song, blow, mountain breeze. Here, Hemans creates the song's poetic texture through a juxtaposition of the sounds of the mountain breeze with the rhythms of the mountaineer's movement across the alpine terrain. She opens and closes the stanzas with the irregular pattern of a trochee, followed by an iam, blow, mountain breeze, seeking to reproduce the blast of wind invoked by the shepherd. This opening and closing invocation frames the middle section of the verse in which fairly regular iambic tetrameters enact the mountaineer's motion as he traverses, ascends and descends the environment's heights and depths. I rove with airy step and spirit free from snowy cliff to shadowy grove. Notably, despite the presumably challenging terrain of snowy cliff and shadowy grove, the mountaineer suffers none of Keats's boggling, stumbling or change ringing. The poem's rhythms enact the mountaineer's mastery of his environment. Charlotte Dacre, in her poem, The Hunter of the Alps, published in Hours of Solitude, 1805, similarly uses her poetic rhythms to create the rapid movement of another version of the mountaineer, this time the chamois hunter. Unceasing from the earliest streak of dawn or sheets of ice and dazzling snow he hides, now on the dizzy step by magic horn, now o'er the precipice like lightning flies. Like Hemans, Dacre varies her energetic iambic rhythms the use of a trochee at the start of the third and fourth lines here, a repeated stress on now, emphasizing the speed of the mountaineer's movement as he appears in different locations in an almost cinematic series of snapshots. Again, like Hemans' shepherd, Baker's idealized figure is removed from the boggling realities of Keats on Ben Nevis, the hunter moving as if by magic horn and flying like lightning. However, Dacre does go on to stress the hardship and dangers of the hunter's existence and offers a final stanza that suggests a parallel between the rhythms of the mountaineer's life and the pleasures of poetry itself. She concludes, yet such a life hath charms, its enterprise, its constant animation and its care gives birth to energy, to energy, its hope arise and saves the soul from torpor and despair. In this celebration of the mountaineering life, Dacre identifies as charms, elements that are equally fundamental to poetry, the constant animation and energy of rhythm. It's these qualities that define both poetry and mountaineering against the torpor and despair of everyday poetic existence. One poet who felt that the rhythms of the mountaineering life could indeed save the soul from torpor and despair was Samuel Taylor Coleridge, a pioneering and daring climber who declared in a letter to Thomas Wedgwood that my soul must have pre-existed in the body of a chamois chaser. I'll put up here a picture of, um, yeah, uh, a picture of Skidor, uh, 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 Scarfell, sorry. Um, see the mountain with which Coleridge is most associated. Coleridge experienced the excitement of being in the mountains as a series of internal rhythms, writing in the same letter that, when alone within the embracement of rocky hills, my spirit courses, drives and eddies like a leaf in autumn, adding, my whole being is filled with waves, as it were, that roll and stumble one this way and one that way. Coleridge's prose brilliantly, 
brilliantly captures the rhythms of mountaineering, of climbing and resting, ascending and descending, and dropping from ledge to ledge, as in his famous account of his near fatal scramble on broad stand. His mountaineering letters and notebooks emphasize the movement of a physical body, which is also frequently a writing body, with pen and paper close to hand. In one notebook entry dated the 5th of August 1802, for example, the poet locates himself as both a climber and writer in relation to Scarfell, quote, which I am now ascending and wrote this on the side of the hill. Seeking to combine physical mobility through landscape with inscriptive movement across the page, Coleridge exudes a heartfelt pleasure in his ascents and descents, capturing the rhythms of climbing within the cadences of his prose, as when he notes, climbed and rested, rested and climbed till I gained the very summit of Scarfell. In this note, the repetition of the two key actions of mountaineering, climbing and resting, produce a palindromic pattern of movement and stillness that silently persists until the very summit is reached. Coleridge registers the repetitions of climbing with a joyful relish. Of a tour up Saddleback in 1800, he writes, mount and mount and mount, the veil now fronting me as I stand. Ascend again and again, leave the precipices and tents behind me, descend northward and descend and then see the tarn. Here, the energy of Coleridge's prose matches the vitality of his physical movement. His use of the present tense to capture the sense of being in the moment, his repetition of his verbs of movement, mount and descend, the fluidity of his punctuation and conjunctions all convey animation and energy rather than the monotony or weariness of Keats's fag and tug to the top of Ben Nevis. For Coleridge, as for Keats, the physical demands of mountaineering alerted him to the movement of his body and to its reciprocal relationship with the external world's materiality. Seen in a notebook jotting from the Keswick to Grasmere Traverse, of 1800. Descended as I bounded down, noticing the moving stones under the moss hurting my feet. Stressing his own rhythmic physicality as he bounds down the mountain, Coleridge remains highly attentive to the world beneath his feet, taking notice of how the stones move under the moss while also registering the effects on his own body hurting my feet. For Coleridge, agony was as much a part of mountaineering as ecstasy, and he frequently juxtaposes the pursuit's physical pains and emotional pleasures. However, the bodily pains, pains produced by mountaineering violent exertions emphasized for Coleridge the fundamentally rhythmic nature of the activity he loved. As with Keats, for whom the awkward movements required to reach Ben Nevis's summit produced a series of rhythms akin to change ringing, so for Coleridge, the coming together of body and landscape could create a certain musicality. Of his 1799 descent of the Great Brocken, a peak he described as without, the, without a rival, the highest mountain in all the north of Germany, Coleridge wrote as follows. My toe was shockingly swollen, my feet bladdered, and my whole frame seemed going to pieces with fatigue. However, I went on, my keynote pain, except when, as not unseldom happened, I struck my toe against a stone or stub, and this, of course, produced a bravura of torture. Here, Coleridge registers the physical effects of what he terms intense bodily exercise, expanding the focus on the affected area from his swollen toe with his blistered feet to his whole frame. His use of an extended musical metaphor for his movement through the rocky terrain with the keynote of pain 
and the bravura of torture, draws attention to his sense of mountaineering's essentially rhythmic nature. The OED defines bravura as having two meanings, a passage or piece of music requiring great skill and spirit in its execution, written to task the artist's powers, a dis display of daring or defiance, brilliancy of execution, dash, attempt a brilliant performance. While Coleridge uses the word to capture the extreme nature of his pain, his metaphor emphasizes that it is the coming together of the mountaineer's body and the challenging terrain that produces this musical effect as toe strikes stone or stub. Mountaineering's rhythms and music are created by the meeting of mountaineer and mountain, the feet and stone, hands and crown, and they in turn stimulates the bravura performance of writing itself. Keats's epistolary ringing of changes on foot and Coleridge's bravura performance of mountain writing beautifully capture the immediate rhythms of mountaineering, of bodily movement through challenging terrain. William Wordsworth, uh, the Romantic period's greatest poet in mountaineering, similarly echoes uh, the rhythms of mountain adventure in his poetry. And so I put up here a contemporary image of Snowdon, uh, the scene of Wordsworth's 1799, 1791 climb, that of course he recounts as the climax of the prelude. And as I talk to Coleridge, I'm also gonna put up a, a couple of contemporary images by Thomas Allen of the Langdale area, where the poet sets a number of his mountaineering poems. While Wordsworth's blank verse is normally associated with the regular cadences of his walking, particularly his pacing back and forth on level ground, his poetry is also marked by the rhythms of mountaineering, as he hurries, plods, toils, climbs, clambers, and scrambles up or down, bounds over mountains like a road, pants up Snowden with eager pace, hangs by knots of grass and half-inch fissures in the slippery rock, and greedy in the chase, roams from hill to hill, from rock to rock, still craving combinations of new forms. And Wordsworth's poetry is also shaped by the larger patterns of the mountaineering life, of ascent and descent, of exertion and rest, of desire to reach the highest point oscillating with dread of the dangers inherent in the elevated environment, of hope matched by the fear of falling, aspiration followed by the potentially fatal return to the earth below. Growing up a rover in the high places on the lonesome peaks among the mountains and the wind, the poet experienced mountaineering's rhythms from an early age. His boyish sports defined by the combined forces of what he terms danger or desire, hope and fear, as in his celebration of the presences of nature, which haunting me thus among my boyish sport, on caves and trees, upon the woods and hills, impressed upon me all the forms, the characters, sorry, impressed upon all forms, the characters of danger and desire and thus did make the surface of the universal earth with triumph and delight and hope and fear work like a sea. In the final part of this paper, I want to outline how the rhythms of mountaineering shape not only words with sense of his development and growth, but also the characteristic movements of the prelude. Stru structuring these rhythms are the oscillating juxtapositions of danger and desire, hope, and fear. Fear is, of course, a key emotion in the prelude, to which Wordsworth describes a major role in his natural education. He describes how he learns from the impressive discipline of fear and famously states that he grew up fostered alike by beauty and by fear. But what does Wordsworthian fear mean in a mountaineering context? It differs from Burke's conception of the sublime as the pleasurable experience of terror in that the poet does not experience fear from a position of safety. 
Rather, danger presses closely without distance or modifications, to use Burke's terms. For Wordsworth, fear involves the risk of physical harm and even potential death. And it's produced by both the poet's hazardous boyhood exploits on the Lake District peaks and by his knowledge of what in the 1799 prelude he describes as the distresses and disasters, tragic facts of rural history, the numerous accidents of which would have included those that happened in the mountains. In Book 8 of the 1805 prelude, Wordsworth presents this rural history of mountaineering disasters and distresses as playing a major role in his own psychological development, linking their tragic facts to his own frequent perils in the mountains. He writes, but images of danger and distress and suffering, these took deepest hold of me, man suffering among awful powers and forms. Of this I heard and saw enough to make the imagination restless, nor was freeing myself from frequent perils, nor were tales wanting, the tragedies of former times, of hazards and escapes, which in my walks I carried with me among crags and woods and mountains. Not only did Wordsworth himself experience the frequent perils of the mountain and woodland environments in which he ran wild then, but he also internalized the Lake District's terrifying but exhilarating history of hazards and escapes. In, these, in this phrase, hazards and escapes, Wordsworth offers a characteristic juxtaposition of the dangers and exhilarations afforded by the mountain environment. Repeated in the tales and internalized by the poet during his adventures, these hazards and escapes form the underlying rhythm of the mountaineering life. As an illustration of such tales of hazards and escapes, Wordsworth offers a story as recorded by my household dame, the matron's tale originally written in October 1800 for Michael. This exciting tale combines a powerful account of embodied movement through the specific mountain terrain around Grasmere with an examination of fear as an emotion experienced by those whose lives are imperiled by the dangerous territory. In this exhilarating tale of mountain adventure, a shepherd and his son range across the fells of the Grasmere area in search of a lost sheep. The father and son separate, and the potential hazards of the mountain-based search are increased by the worsening weather conditions. The boy finds the sheep, but it's perilously positioned on an island in the brook. The boy instinctively leaps onto this island only for the sheep to jump off it and get swept away by the roaring flood. It's at this point that Wordsworth introduces the emotion of fear, describing how, quote, the boy looked round him and his heart fainted with fear. Here, fear is no burky and pleasurable sensation of terror experienced from a position of safety. Rather, to use Burke's terms, danger presses too nearly and is simply terrible. Fear paralyzes the boy. He becomes incapable of movement, unable to summon up the courage that was needful to leap back across the tempestuous torrent. Wordsworth specifically links the boy's fear to the possibility of his death, describing how he stood a prisoner on the island not without more than one thought of death and his last hour. And the boy's, the boy's fear is mirrored by that of his father when he sees him in this life-threatening location. Quote, the sight was such as no one could have seen without distress and fear. Wordsworth here makes the emotion of fear universal, universal to anyone witnessing such a scene. His linking of the emotion to distress recalling the images of danger and distress and suffering with which he had begun the passage. 
Like many a mountaineering story since, Wordsworth's tale of mountain rescue takes the action to the brink with both father, son, and the, any other who might see the sight experiencing fear. Having touched the void, to adopt the title of a more recent tale of near fatal mountaineering adventure, the tale moves swiftly to a happy ending. The shepherd heard the outcry of his son, he stretched his staff towards him, bade him leap, which word scarce said the boy was safe within his father's arms. As an exciting narrative of hazard and escape, Wordsworth's Matron's Tale anticipates many of the tropes that would become central to the genre of mountain adventure over the following two centuries. Drawing on the poet's own develop developing experience of climbing, climbing the mountains around Grasmere, in its linking fear to possible fatality, the tale provides a valuable commentary on Wordsworth's account of his boyhood mountain adventures and on the role he allocates to fear in his education by the impressive agency of fear. The potentially fatal nature of Wordsworth's childhood mountain adventures that have given them such a formative influence in his development. But fear is not the only emotion experienced when mountaineering, of course. And in words of poetry, it oscillates with hope, as becomes especially clear in the next section of the prelude, as the poet considers what for him was the archetypal mountaineering figure, the shepherd. The shepherd is, of course, a mountaineer in what was both the established and emergent senses of the word, but once a native of the upland environment and someone skilled and experienced in moving quickly and efficiently in the mountain terrain. The poet describes him as ascending fast with his long pole in hand or winding in and out among the crags. As a mountaineer, the shepherd's life is defined by a particular rhythm, which Wordsworth describes as follows. He feels himself in those vast regions where his service is a freeman, wedded to his life of hope and hazard and hard labour interchanged with that majestic indolence so dear to native man. The shepherd's life of hope and hazard presents his existence as a daily encounter with the dangers central to the hazards and escapes which so obsessed the poet during his own perilous mountain adventures. Yet here the risks inher inherent in this hazardous life are balanced with the emotion of hope. The shepherd embodies an existence defined by the same structures of danger and desire, hope and fear that the poet felt had formed his own sense of being. Both are shaped by the rhythms of mountaineering. Wordsworth's identification of the rhythm of hope and hazard within the shepherd's life offers a remarkable Cumbrian equivalent to Horace, the ben Horace Benedict de Saussure's description of the perilous existence of alpine chamois hunters, which was very well known in the period. De Saussure, a Genevan man of science uh, and a mountaineer, seen here in the red coat making the third ascent of Mont Blanc in 1787, published Travels in the Alps, uh, first part, in 1796 to seven, a year before Wordsworth began the prelude and pays homage to the chamois hunter who, he writes, undertakes the most dangerous routes, climbs, leaps from rock to rock without knowing how he will get down. De Saussure links the hunter's dangerous occupation to other pursuits involving risk, a grouping in which he includes the figure of the scientific mountaineer that he himself embodied, commenting, but it is these very dangers, this alternation of hope and fear, the continual agitation kept alive by these sensations in his heart, which excite the huntsman, just as they animate the gambler, the warrior, the sailor, and even to a certain point, the naturalist among the Alps, whose life closely resembles, whose life resembles closely in some respects that of the chamois hunter. Like the life of Wordsworth's shepherd, 
defined by hope and hazard, the Saussure chamois hunter exists in a condition of alternation of hope and fear. Wordsworth, like de Saussure, compared his own role with that of the chamois hunter, describing how in the prelude he had, I quote, tracked the main essential power, imagination, up her way sublime, a phrase which turns the poet into the agile hunter of the chamois-like imagination. For the two writer mountaineers, the daring figures of the shepherd and the hunter offered versions of the mountaineering identity that enabled an articulation of the attractions of a dangerous life in the mountains while providing heroic metaphors for their own vocations as poet and naturalist, respectively. The final paragraph now. Over 200 years after the Cumbrian poet and Geneva man of scientists and Geneva man of science had described the lives of the shepherd and the chamois hunter, Robert McFarlane, another mountaineer and writer, responded in Mountains of the Mind to de Saussure's description as follows. When I read this passage, passage just quoted, it made absolute sense to me, despite the intervening centuries. As de Saussure said, risk-taking brings with it its own reward. It keeps a continual agitation alive in the heart. Hope, fear, hope, fear. This is the fundamental rhythm of mountaineering. Life, it frequently seems in the mountains, is lived more, is more intensely lived the closer one gets to its extinction. We never feel so alive as when we have nearly died. In identifying this fundamental rhythm of mountaineering, McFarlane's analysis of de Saussure provides a framework for understanding Wordsworth's presentation of the mountaineering life. For de, Saussure, for de Saussure's and McFarlane's hope, fear, hope, fear, we can read Wordsworth's hope, hazard, danger and desire, and indeed, hope and fear. Growing up in the mountains, Wordsworth lived the fundamental rhythm of mountaineering. And this rhythm structured both his own development and his powerful account of it in his epic masterpiece, The Prelude. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, um, Simon, for such a masterly, uh, very short introduction to the essentials of uh, romantic mountaineering and how uh, the physical movement, the uh, physical stress uh, and rest and the dangers and exhilarations get into the rhythmic textures of so much uh, romantic writing uh, about the mountaineering experience. It's been a, a brilliant uh, tour through um, the Scottish Highlands, the Lake District peaks, uh, the North Welsh mountains and the Alps. Um, a, a terrific experience for um, Saturday morning here uh, and our first presentation at the late summer seminar. Now, um, we do have plenty of time for questions and the routine for this, uh, as Paige said at the start, is that you should press your raise hand button on your screen if you have a question to ask and I'll set it going while uh, you're all thinking. Um, can you start, Simon, by just saying something very briefly about uh, the Romantics footwear? It struck me when Coleridge was describing how the movement of stones underneath the moss hurt his feet, uh, that he might not have what we would call state-of-the-art footwear for mountaineering on. Do you have any idea uh, what he might have worn? It's a, a good question, Nick, and people are very interested in understanding so in the whole sense of sort of equipment, which is this is uh, in the Alps at the time, you know, equipment is already quite developed. So people are using crampons and you know versions of the uh, of poles. And, and that sort of sense of equipment is just beginning to start to be uh, adopted um, in England at the time. So for example, the Smith sisters have a specially made mountaineering pole with which they climb um, Helvellyn. In terms of footwear, 
Um, Coleridge is just wearing the standard boots that he would, would have worn. We've not yet got to the stage of starting to put nails or anything like that in, into it. Well, there were a few people beginning to experiment with the notion of kind of um, nailed boots to provide greater grip. In one of, I think it's in a notebook entry rather than a letter, Coleridge does start to design a boot. Um, so he's beginning to think about equipment in that way. Wordsworth, we know, had his, had his boots double soled because of the, the damage done by um, his, his own mountaineering, his own mountaineering uh, exploits. But certainly the, the equipment um, the, the, uh, uh, took a fair bashing um, from Coleridge. I think we know that uh, when he returns from his famous circumcursion around the lakes, his, um, his trousers have, have, have been ripped uh, and need repairing. And clearly from that, that extract I read about the damage done to his toes and so on, you know, he's not getting the amount of protection that we might, that, that we might, that we might, might hope. So there's sort of the general sense is, um, in England at the time, it's pretty standard, uh, it's pretty standard clothing that's being worn, but people yeah. are just beginning to think about sort of what we would now call technical gear, you know, specialised items of equipment or footwear. That's very interesting. Thanks very much. Um, Nick, Nick Dodd, um, well, welcome. Have you got a question for Simon? Uh, hang on. Um, yes, am I? I'm there. Right. Yes. My question was about the um, matron's tale. And um, well, it's just various thoughts about it. Um, one, it's, it's, it's relatively unusual in the prelude because it's, it's, it's so obviously uh, attributed to someone else. Um, <laughs> And it's attributed to uh, his dame, so his sort of surrogate mother, who, who who has a kind of interesting role, for instance, at the start of Nutting, and also when he returns home in Book Four, and a passage which I love about his bed, um, she's there. But 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 the Matrix Tale sort of doesn't make it to the to the to the final cut. I just wondered whether you had any thoughts about all of that. You know that that it's her, uh, as it were. She kind of maps the Lake District for him as a place of, of almost sort of, you know, mourning, uh, remembering through accidents. Um, and and what, any thoughts about why he, he cut it in the end? Just all that stuff. I just wonder if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, thanks very much, Nick. It's a really interesting question because it's a, it's a fantastic piece of poetry, isn't it? I mean, it's a wonderful um, tale. Uh, and so uh, it's sort of ambivalent status for Wordsworth, as you say, sort of surprises us, doesn't it, in that way? Um, my understanding is he writes it initially uh, for Michael, uh, and so uh, the suggestion is that you know that you know that it's Michael and his son, who, uh, Luke, who may be the two figures who then become these these sort of anonymized figures. And it's interesting that he doesn't include it in Michael because what is so fantastic about it, I think, is that whole sense of the way in which I mean, you put it beautifully, it maps the hills around Grasmere through movement. You know, it's a fantastic celebration of that particular landscape and of the, um, the intimidating and potentially dangerous nature of, of, of that landscape. And my sense is that maybe that doesn't fit with the very close focus on a particular place, Greenhead Gill, that, that, that we get in Michael. So that's where it feels to me that it then starts to sort of sit uneasily in the poem uh, for which it's, 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 first, it's first designed. Um, and then, as you say, has this has this this continuing sort of um, strange status. I've not thought about attribution. I continue will continue to um, to think about that. I mean, it does have that sense of um, a separate life. It feels as if it is it is a, a separate tale that is then doesn't quite fit in the into the autobiographical nature of Wordsworth's own account. Even if, as, as I hope I was showing. You know, its sense of um, fear and its highlighting of the emotion of fear into the into, into the into the, the legacy landscape. I find very helpful in thinking about that key emotion uh, for Wordsworth. Yeah, so that's that, great. Okay. Uh, we have we have questions coming up from Heidi Snow, Elias Gregg, and Bruce Graver. And Heidi was um, first in the line. I think over to you, Heidi. Thank you, Nick. Um, I'm wondering about, I love the pattern that you set up of, of sort of activity and rest with Coleridge and 
Hope and Fear with Wordsworth. And I'm, I'm wondering if you see a parallel or is there a difference between Coleridge's rest and Wordsworth's majestic indolence? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, um, yeah, I mean, majestic indolence, that's part of the life of the shepherd, isn't it? Um, and what I think both uh, of the poets are very interested in is this sort of oscillation um, that mountaineering uh, provides between these moments of extreme psychological and physical stress and then um, these moments of stillness. Um, and I'm not sure that those moments of stillness would generally fit into the, the way I've been thinking about them, I'm not sure they'd fit into Coleridge's uh, or Wordsworth's patterns of majestic indolence, because they tend to be the moments of um, uh, recovery almost. So sort of like when, when Coleridge has made his descent of broad stand and is then lying just above fat man's agony and has this moment of stillness that brings about the state of almost prophetic trance, as he says, as he says, or when, um, Wordsworth is, is hanging from the rock. And there's again, you know, bizarre moments of stillness as if suspended. I mean, for me, though that it's that oscillation and those moments that actually produce the sort of the visionary states of romanticism. So one of the things I'm very interested in in the book is the sense that those, you know, a, a romantic sense of the visionary often comes out of this extreme sort of physical uh, movement uh, and physical moments of, of danger. Um, so I think, yeah, for me, those, those moments of, of, uh, uh, of rest are probably still moments of kind of recovery from the fear. The adrenaline is, is kind of still pulsing, I think. Um, whereas the majestic indolence strikes me as the moments when the, you know, the, sh the shepherd is free of adrenaline. Okay, a uh, quick question from Elias and Bruce, please. Elias, first. Thank you very much, Simon. This wonderful paper, and particularly following the prosody of walking uphill. It's very strange to be asking this question without being out of breath myself from some kind of qualifying A walk. <laughs> I both miss and don't miss Fairfield, mount and mount and mount. <laughs> yeah. um, just a quick one about the kind of political valency of exposure and extremists. Um, a lot of Wordsworth's poetry in particular depends on the materialization of a kind of perilous nature to produce sometimes you know, various kinds of political effects. Um, thinking particularly here of 1792 or drafted in 1792 poem descriptive sketches where the chamois hunter that you're pulling out in the prelude has his kind of debut as a quest for freedom rather than for imagination. Um, I wonder if you see a sort of changing or modification of tone in moving from questing for freedom to questing for, um, for imagination in the prelude. Sure, uh, very interesting. That, yeah, thanks very much, Elias. Um, it's, it's a great point. And I mean, just first of all, on your issue of Mount and Mount, I mean, it's quite interesting the difference between Keats and, and Coleridge on that. You know, for Keats, he really suffers from that nightmare sense of, oh, we're at the summit, no, we're not. There's another stress. Whereas, you know, Coleridge is trying to find more things to go up. You know, he's searching for, for extra things. I mean, what I would say in response um, to the figure of the chamois hunter is certainly it is a figure who, who changes in meaning. Uh, I think it very much does become um, a, uh, a representative for freedom. Um, I mean, you, you see that even in, in Heman's um, uh, poem about... Um, the Alpine Shepherd rather than the Shamwa Hunter. But I think what you get is that this is a kind of, both the, those um, mountaineering figures themselves get contested um, as to what version of freedom they represent. You know, so they, do they represent a freedom that's outside the state um, or do they represent a freedom that's representative of the state? Um, and then, yeah, you, you also get the, the contest over, over over yeah, the, the, the meaning of freedom itself and what does, what does it mean um, to be free. So I've written in the book actually an, an account of um, the excursion in which the notion of the mountaineering identity becomes a key, um, a key role and tried to show sort of in a way, as you suggest, how the figure of the mountaineer changes through words which earth, but ends up 
ultimately is a kind of representative for um, this increasing conservative conservatism of that and orthodoxy of that of that period, but still with the certain certain kind of glamour that the, that the figure has from those early examples, as you say, in descriptive sketches. So, OK, and, and Bruce, if you'd like to wind up the questions, because we've got to move on to the next stage. So over to you, Bruce. Um, more comment than question, really. One is about the um, shoes. By the time they're crossing the Alps in 1820, they've all got nailed shoes. And Dorothy talks about it specifically. The other thing, um, I was going to say something about the matron's tale, but I don't need to do that. So uh, thanks very much, Simon. Uh, thanks, Bruce. And do you know any more about the, those nailed shoes? I mean, is, is, do they have those made in England and take them across, you know, or are they able to buy them while they're over there? Well, I'm not really sure about that. I think they might have been putting nails in them themselves. Yeah. Um, just because, you know, that's what you might do. Yeah. I mean, as I said, one of the one of the things you get in a lot of the travel writing is, is the debate around this and certain people saying nail shoes will help you go up Snowden and help grip on the grass. So it's odd that the nail shoes, which are almost like a version of the crampons for snow, start to be adopted because of that relationship between British climbing and Alpine climbing. You get other travel writers who sort of laugh at this idea that you might need a nail shoe to help you on the grass, but, it, but it's only only for ice. So that's that's very interesting fact about the 1820s. I didn't know that, so thanks very much. Well, you might actually have um, hit on the passage where she talks about it, because I think it's specifically when they're doing the glaciers in Chamonix. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Well, thanks very much uh, again, um, Simon, for a wonderful lecture, for getting us going um, today. Uh, there's so much to talk about uh, in your material, um, from the, the, the physical stresses of mountaineering to the way it registers in uh, meter and uh, imaginative uh, patterns in romantic writing. Um, uh, and as several of the questions have suggested, there's a lot to say about as well, as it were, about the materiality of actually going about um, mountaineering. Um, it, it's been, uh, as I say, a wonderful start to the day. And thank you very